All right. Praise the Lord. Guess what we're talking about today? We've been talking about the Holy Ghost, right? The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Today is the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. So, just happened to fall on today. Look at that. Praise the Lord. So, we're going to talk about Acts chapter 1. We're going to begin there. But let's pray right now in the name of the Lord and ask the Lord to help us today in the name of Jesus. Father, we love you today and we thank you, Lord, for this day. We celebrate, God, the birth of the church today and we thank you, Lord God, for filling us with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, for making great on every promise that you've ever made and we give you praise for it today. I pray, God, the anointing of heaven would rest upon every classroom this morning and that you would be here with us today in the name of Jesus. We give you all the praise for it. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can be seated. Acts chapter 1 begins, when we look at the book of Acts, we start looking at where the Holy Ghost is or the Holy Spirit is mentioned. And it's right there in the very first chapter when Jesus says, and they were come together and they asked him saying, Lord, will, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be a witness unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, what we talked about last time is the the fact that there is a difference in being Uh, overshadowed or overcome or touched by the Spirit, and then the difference of being baptized by the Spirit. Remember, John the Baptist introduced that terminology for us, and and that first time we've ever seen that in the Bible is when John the Baptist says, but the God is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And then Jesus even said that uh, if you believe on me as a scripture has said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living waters. This spake he of the Holy Ghost, which had not yet been given, or had not yet, if you translate it correctly. And so, what does that mean? That means that whatever John the Baptist was talking about, whatever Jesus was talking about, was going to be a different experience than what they had already experienced all the way through the Bible. And um, so, this is, and when we what, what, what are they doing is they're pointing towards the day of Pentecost. And Jesus now, just a few days, 10 days before Pentecost, he tells them, he says, now go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. And what is he talking about? The promise of the Holy Ghost. He says, the promise that you heard from me, the promise that you heard from the, from the prophets of the Old Testament, the promise of that John the Baptist talked about. So Jesus said, it's coming. So go to Jerusalem and wait. So everything that was spoken by the prophets, including John's ministry, is pointing towards this outpouring of the Holy Ghost. All that Jesus says regarding to it was about to come to pass when 120 believers gathered at Jerusalem for about approximately 10 days, praying, waiting, conducting meetings, uh, appointing another apostle to replace Judas, they were, they were doing all of this. They were eating. I think they were fasting for 10 days. I guess they could have been, but uh, some people think, well, they were just praying for 10 days straight. Well, they probably slept. They probably had to eat. They conducted some meetings, and uh, so they were in and out, but there it was suddenly. It, then it happened on in Acts chapter 2, verse number 1, and suddenly they heard a sound from heaven heaven, like a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire that sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. So now this, a lot of people will look at that scripture and they go, wow, that's that's new. That's different. That's never happened before. And that's true, but it really shouldn't shock us that the baptism of the Holy Ghost gives the the people spirit-empowered speech because we have seen that all the way through the Bible. Even every time somebody got the Holy or was uh, touched by the or overshadowed or the Holy Spirit came upon him or came upon them, they prophesied. That what, what does that mean? Does that mean they told for future events? Well, sometimes, but not all the time. 
when they prophesied, it just, there was other times when they said what they prophesied. They were magnifying the Lord. And so you can magnify the Lord in, in a prophetic sense as the Spirit gives you the utterance. Well, in this instance, they were not, uh, well, they were magnifying the Lord, weren't they? They were magnifying the Word. They were, they were magnifying or they were describing the wonderful works of God in languages that they had never learned before. And so, this is what, what happened. And Jesus even told us this was going to happen. In Mark chapter 16, He says, and, uh, and these signs shall follow them that believe. They will speak with tongues. So, He already told us that this was going to happen previous to this. So, when it did happen, they knew. Hey, they were like, hey, Jesus said this was going to happen. This is absolutely what the promise was all about. And, um, and so we understand that the, the speaking in tongues was a sign for the believers because it's, he says, it, those who believe, these signs will follow them that believe. So God breathed at this moment in history, God breathed life into the body of believers that was his church. So this, now these 120 tongue-talking apostolic Pentecostals in the upper room would become the bride spoken of in the parables. This would be his body, his hands, and his feet. They would be the ones to continue the work that Jesus both began to do and to teach. This was the body of believers that was going to take this forward. Um, so th these would be the ones that would have authority, authority, to, authority to preach and authority to loose and to bind this would be the group of people that would have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So this is them. This is it right here. This was the birthday of the church. This is the reason why we celebrate Pentecost Sunday even today. And churches all around the world, I would hope, praise God, would even at least acknowledge that today is Pentecost Sunday. And I always pray that as they prepare their sermons and they read the book of Acts, that they would, their minds and their eyes would be opened, that they would see that, hey, Pentecost is for us still today. So this was the day that the church was formed. It was not formed in some ecumenical council by the Roman emperor in 314 A.D., otherwise known as the Roman Catholic Church. It wasn't formed then, even though most of the Catholics would tell you that they are the original religion. They are the the first church, and they are not. The very first church was right here on Pentecost Sunday in the Bible, right here. It was not formed by John Wesley. It wasn't formed by John Calvin, Martin Luther, or Joseph Smith. It wasn't formed by the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Catholics, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, or any other organization that we have today. It was formed right here in Acts chapter 2. So let me just interject here this morning with my apostolic false doctrine sledgehammer and say, forget everything you've ever been taught about how church should act, how church should worship, how churches should live, and how churches should be saved. Forget everything you've ever learned about it, praise God, and relearn it from the book of Acts perspective. Mark chapter 7 and verse number 13, the Bible says, Jesus says, he's talking to him about some traditions that they have. And he says, you make traditions, your traditions are more valuable than the Word of God. And he says, in fact, he says, you're making the Word of God to none effect through your traditions. And there's churches all around the world today. There are people all around the world today that their traditions hold more power to them than the Scripture. And that's why I say, bless God, if they, as they're preparing their sermons today, let their traditions fall by the wayside and let the Word of God be true. Praise God. So this is Peter's message. Now, when this was happened and these people were speaking in other tongues and uh, acting the way that they were acting, which was not normal, Right? They were acting crazy. In fact, some said they were drunk. So however they were acting, they were acting like drunk people speaking in other tongues. And uh, people say, well, that's not how we act. Well, that's how the first church acted. 
play praise God. So, well, that's not our tradition. Well, it may not be, but that's how they did it there. Yeah. Praise God. That's the first church. They were not out of line. They were not out of order. They were absolutely in the will of God. They were fulfilling prophecy. And so, and it wasn't some one-off thing. It continued all the way through the book of Acts. We'll get to that next time. But today we're just focusing on Pentecost mainly. But So when this was noised abroad, the Bible says, when the people that were in Jerusalem celebrating the day of Pentecost, when Pentecost, by the way, just means 50th, it's, uh, it doesn't have really much to do, the, the terminology doesn't have anything to do with Pentecostalism or a religion or a denomination. Pentecost is just a Jewish celebration, and, it's, and it falls 50 days after Passover. And uh, there's a whole other Bible study on that, but uh, there, it's not a coincidence that this happened on the day of Pentecost. God's plan was and always was to pour out His Spirit on this day, and it's significant. Um, but anyway, so when this was noise abroad, and all the people that were in Jerusalem heard that the people in these, this upper room, which they must have come out of the upper room at some point, um, maybe they were in the streets at this point, speaking in tongues and magnifying God, and when everybody who was there in Jerusalem, now in Jerusalem on this day, on, on the day of Pentecost, or that whole week, the whole week. It's people come from all over the, all over the land, and all, different countries, and they come in and they celebrate Pentecost, and then this was the biggest day. This was the last day. This was when everybody was there. So God did this in the, not in some back corner somewhere. He did it right in Main Street when everybody was going to be there. And uh, besides that, there's another reason why God chose Pentecost is so that everybody who was there at Pentecost and who experienced this would take that back home. So this was a, also a way to spread the gospel immediately from one place to all of Judea and, and to the uttermost, even just even on that day. So here they are. They're there. They, and they speak different languages because they come from different countries and different places. And they're, they're amazed, and they're like, hey, we know that these guys are Galilean, and they should not be able to speak all of these different languages, and they, they obviously saw that this was a supernatural event. And so they asked Peter and the brother, and they said, what does this mean? And he says, this is that that was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And he, so he began preaching to them and talking to them about these Old Testament scriptures, which we've already discussed, and we've, we've already rehearsed all of those. But here's what he said in Acts chapter 2, verse number 17. He stood up with the 11 and he said, and it shall come to pass. He said, this is that that was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And then he quotes the prophet. He says, and it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall see visions and your, and your, sorry, your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So here, how do we know that Joel, Joel's prophecy is a prophecy about them speaking in tongues? Because he says it. He said that, that Joel said that they would prophesy, and this is what they are doing. So it, it is fulfillment of that prophecy. He goes on, he talks to him about the prophet David, he talks to him about other prophecies that, that this is being fulfilled, and then we catch him back up here at verse 36. He says, therefore, let all of the house of Israel know surely that, that God hath made that same Jesus who you crucified 50 days ago, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We just crucified the Messiah. We have really messed up. And Peter said to them, no problem. Just repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the washing away, the remission of all your sins, and you shall receive the, the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is for you and to your children and to as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now that that whole statement there is power-packed, full of all kinds of stuff. But I want to focus right here on this. He says, and, 
and, uh, and it sh- this promise is for you and your children. Now, that has a lot of significance in uh, the, the mind of a Jewish theologian or the, the mind of a, of a Jewish believer because of the Old Testament and because of what happened 50 days prior. Fifty days prior, when Pilate was trying to save Jesus' life, he was pleading with the crowd, and he said, he was, I find no fault in him. Don't, we don't want to kill him here. That, that we don't want to crucify him. Come on. Let me beat him. Let me whip him. Let me do all this stuff to him, please. And they were like, no, crucify him. And it, to the point where he got a basin of water, and he washed his hands of this, and and he was actually doing that for their custom. That was a Jewish custom to wash your hands, and like I'm cleansing myself. You know, the Jews, they always washed and cleansed themselves, and so he did this, and he says, my hands are clean from the blood of this man. I tried, and they said to him, they said, don't worry about it, Pilate. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. So when Peter said, don't worry, the mercy of God will be extended to you. The blood that you have on your hands from from Messiah will be washed clean in the watery grave of baptism. And this promise is for you and your children. We're, We're letting them all off the hook today. Praise God. So, but there's more to it than just that. There's more to that scripture than just that they had, they had cursed their children, basically, just a few days before. And, and then I want to get to this because there's a little bit of confusion sometimes about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the interpretation of the prophet Joel. And I glazed over this when we went through Joel previously when we were in the Old Testament, and I thought, well, I'll, maybe we'll talk about it when we get to the New Testament. So we're here today. So when he prophesied, and he said, this is that that was prophesied by the prophet Joel, the baptism of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, um, let's make sure that we're clear in interpreting our Scripture correctly. And we go back to Joel, and Joel is, um, is broken down into four segments, well, at least the four that we're going to talk about today. First, and we're going to talk about chapter 1 in chapter 2, and a little bit of chapter 3 of Joel. I think there's three chapters in Joel, right? Yeah, that's it. Three chapters in Joel. So the majority of the book of Joel is broken into four segments, which we would call four periods of time. And this is important. So first, we begin in chapter 1, when Joel begins to say that because the children of Israel were out of they had turned their backs on God, that God was going to send them a plague, uh, a plague of locust, a famine, of uh, drought. He was going to withhold the rains. He was going to send the um, locust upon them. That is verses 1 through, okay, Joel 1, 1 through 2 and 11. So this is this period of time or this, this description of judgment encompasses one and a half chapters, okay? So he goes on. I'll just read some of these here. The verse, uh, Joel 1 and 1, the word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear on all the inhabitants of the land Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children and other generation. This is the judgment. He said, that which the palmer worm hath left, the locust has eaten. And that which the locust has left, the canker worm has eaten. And he goes on and on. Now, understand that this is not many different insects. This is one insect. And this insect is... What do you call that when they grow? They metamorphose themselves into different categories. So it's, just, it's, one, it's one bug here that's growing. 
It's, it's eating, and it's changing, and it's becoming more fierce as it goes and as it grows. Awaken, you drunkards, and weep and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because the new wine is cut off from your mouth. Why is the new wine going to be cut off from their mouth? Because the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locusts are going to eat the grapevines, and there's not going to be any more wine. There's not going to be any more anything. It's going to be all dried up. Uh, he hath laid my vine to waste, and hath barked my fig tree, and hath made it clean and bare, and his branches thereof made, made waste. He goes on and on just like this. It's just continues and continues. And then in verse 12 of chapter 2, this is the, the second segment. So the first segment is about the destruction of Israel because they have turned their back on God. And now the section 2 is going to be chapter 2, verse 12 through 18. And that is when Joel says, but I'm going to call you now to repent. You need to turn from your wicked ways and turn back to God, and fast and pray. And he goes on and on for just a few verses. And then we go to the next segment, which is the third segment, and that is the mercy of is going to be extended to them after they pray and fast and ask for repentance. So when they do this, he says, I will then, I will, no problem, guys, I'm going to restore your land. I'm going to bring back the rain. I'm going to bring all this back, and I'm going to deliver you from the hand of the oppressor, and, and everything's going to be all right. And then there's a fourth segment that begins at Joel chapter 2, 28. And that is now Joel moves on to another period of time. And that is the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, which we see at Pentecost. All right. So let's go back just for a moment to the first segment. Because there's a lot of confusion here. People are like, well, we're not sure if the first segment, like I have in my notes right here, you might see the little blue writing there on my corner. I've had this Bible 20 years. No, no. How long have we been in a church? We've, we've been in this church 20 years almost, so I've had it longer than that. 25 years I've had this. So 25 years ago, so thereabouts, I wrote those little blue words in my Bible because somebody taught me something because they were confused about Joel. And I wrote it down, and I preached it as I have used to preach those little blue words right there. Yeah, isn't that nice? It's bad because it's not true doctrine. It's like, yeah, somebody looked at Joel, and instead of interpreting it with a grammatical historical method, they used the allegorical method instead. And uh, they said, oh, okay, well, the first three verses, this, is, this represents the persecuted church from 96 A.D. to 300 A.D. That's what it says here. And then the the then in chapter one verse number five through eleven this is this is the imperial church this is the the church age of three hundred and thirteen A.D. to five hundred A.D. where the Holy Ghost the wine's going to be all dried up and then it goes it it goes downhill from there really um, so so I had to repent of that and say okay well let, let me read this again and figure this out and I've had some other people trying to help me with that so that's good. It's good to have people help to, to show you the Word of God more, more perfectly, right? That's all right. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the first segment. This is the period of time that, by the way, the Jewish people were already warned about this. In fact, this is not the very first time that the children of Israel were warned about this going to happen. It was twice already in, in Israel's history they were warned that this was going to happen. Now, uh, if you go all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, all the way back in the law, when they were coming down off Mount Sinai, he says, now there's going to be blessings upon you and all these things are going to be great, but if you ever turn your back upon me, God said, uh, Deuteronomy 28 and 15, he says, but it shall come to pass, if thou will not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and you will not observe to do all of his commandments and his statutes, which I have commanded thee this day, that all the curses that I am about to tell you are going to come upon you and overtake thee. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. 
And then he goes on and he says, thou shalt be cursed when you rise up. You'll be cursed when you lay down. You'll be cursed every time you look to the west, the north, the east. And he goes on and on and on and on and on for many, many verses about how bad they're going to be cursed. We're going to pick this back up at verse number 38. Thou shalt carry much seed into the field and shall gather gather but a little because the locust shall consume it. You can see how that connects to Joel. The locusts are going to consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but neither shall you drink of the wine nor gather of the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. This is Joel 1.0 right here, right? Prophecy 1.0, Joel is prophecy 2.0. All right. Uh, Verse number 40, thou shalt have olive trees throughout all of the coast, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with oil. The oil is going to be dried up. Isn't that what Joel said? And we always say, well, that's the Holy Ghost. Well, that's not, we wouldn't think that here. Okay. For thine olive shall cast its fruit. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters. Here, the generation. Even your next generation is going to be messed up. Thou shalt not enjoy them. For they shall go into captivity. Now here. He says, not only is your land going to be affected, but you're going to go into captivity as well. And all thy trees and thy fruit and thy land shall the locusts consume. And they shall be upon thee for a sign, for a wonder, and upon thy seed, your children, forever. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyness and gladness of heart for the abundance of things. For thou shalt, uh, therefore, thou sh- for, therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies Who are they going to serve? You won't serve me. You will become captive to the enemies. Now, we can go on and on here. Deuteronomy is a prophecy about the day when the northern enemy will invade Israel and take them captive. We're talking about the Babylonian exile. And that is what Joel is talking about. So you go back to the first section in chapter And then the second time this has happened is when Solomon, remember he built the tabernacle or the temple, and God filled the temple, remember that? And he prayed, and the blessings of God came upon him, and and God spoke to Solomon and said, this day is a great day, but if you ever turn from me, I will mess up your land, I will cause drought to come upon you, and all these bad things will happen. And if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, they will repent, then I will heal their land. Okay? So that's the second time it happened. Joel's the third time. And Joel's like, guys, it's coming now. It's intimate. So here's Joel to interpret this correctly. Now, some of these say, well, Joel chapter 1, this first part in Joel about all the the wine being dried up and the, and the, and the, uh, the, the locust coming. Some say, well, it's metaphorical, and it, it really just means that there's going to be, um, well, let me explain. There's a, there is confusion and debate, I guess, over whether or not the locusts are actually the Babylonians or if the locusts are actually locusts. But that's neither here nor there. The point is, God says bad things are going to happen to you. But we do know that in the first chapter and the second part of Joel, in the, in the destruction prophecy part, the judgment of God upon them part, it does include the army from the north. As he says, there are going to be the, the army from the north is going to come down and they are going to take you away and you will serve your enemy. Now, this is all in Joel, too. So what is he talking about? Joel is not talking about the the withholding of the Holy Ghost in this prophecy. In chapter 1, all the way through the middle of chapter 2, he's talking about the judgment against Israel, whether it's a physical weather climate change and the destruction with with the locusts, or both. It could be both, that there's actually going to be locusts come, there's going to be destruction and famine, And we already know that the Babylonians do come in and take them captive. Now, this goes into the segment two, and that is the call to repentance. And Joel is not the only one that prophesies about this. There are many of the prophets that prophesy about the coming doom 
of the exile of the Babylonians and the Assyrians, right? And, the, and all of them will say, this, the, you're going to be taken away, you're going to lose your land, but if you repent, God will bring you back to your land. Right? So this, Joel's not the only one that says this, but Joel says it also. And he says, now, if you repent and you fast, and you, I'm going to quote, we'll quote the, the Chronicles. If you turn from your wicked ways, if you seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal your land. So let's see how Joel puts that. Joel says in Joel 2 and 20, but I will remove far off from you the northern army and I will drive him back into a land of barren and desolation. Be glad, verse number 23, verse, chapter 2, verse number 23, be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause it to come down for you, the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Hold it right there. Let's not misinterpret that verse. And some will many, many times, I probably have it written in my Bible, that the early rain and the latter rain are going to rain together. And that's not what it says. That's how we've misinterpreted it. If that were true, let me just explain how rain works. Anybody ever plant crops? Raise your hand real high if you've planted crops. Okay? What happens if you get too much rain? It's just as bad as no rain. In fact, it could be worse depending on how you look at it. So if God says, I'm going to heal your land, your crops are going to don't worry about it. We're going to make it flood in the springtime. They would be like, uh, that, that don't work out. Please don't do that. That would be a curse upon us. Okay, but so you have to understand, then, then what does it say? Well, he, he says it already. He, he explains it. And, and this is where we get mixed up here is the King James translation of this. And if you have to go back to the original and translate it um, outside of what, again, our traditions might not help us here. Okay, here's what he said. He says, I'm going to send the former rain moderately. And what that word moderately interpreted would mean in the exact measure that it needs to. And because he says it twice, we think that it's going to happen twice. We think that the former rain or the, the fall rains are going to come again in the spring, but that's not how it should be interpreted. So the former rains will come down and the latter rains will fall in their month. So you'll have the fall rains, the first, and then you'll have the spring rains, the second, the latter rain. And they will come according to where, how they're supposed to come. And they will come in their moderation, in the exact amount that they need to. Now, doesn't that sound like a better blessing? Yes. So it's not to be interpreted that the former and the latter rain are going to rain at the same time. The NIV, I'll read the NIV, but you can go look at the ESV, the, all the, these hundreds of other versions of the Bible, and they're going to translate it this way. Be glad, people of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for He has given you the autumn rains because He's faithful, and He will send you abundant showers both in the autumn and the spring as He's done before. Does that make better sense? So he says, don't worry about it. The the the, fall, the fall rains, because that's the rains that was going to come first. He says the fall rain's going to come, and it's going to come right when it's supposed to. And then he goes on to say, in fact, the fall rains are going to come when they're supposed to, and the autumn rains are going to come when they're supposed to. Do you see how that works? Never did he say they're going to come all at the same time. It should not be interpreted that way. Okay, so when he says that, and the rains will return... He, in verse 24, and the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and with oil. Why will, the, why will we ha now have an overflowing of wine and oil? Because the rains came back. Because the locusts were driven away. 
Because this, the land is going to be restored. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten and the cankerworm and the caterpillar and, and my great army which I sent among you. Now, again, is he talking about the army of the locust? Or is he talking about the army of the Babylonians? Could be both. Could be one or the other. It doesn't matter uh, for my point here today, I should say. And you shall eat in the plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. He hath dwelt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Now, this prophecy is fulfilled when he drives back the northern invaders. He restores the land to the people of Israel. And this prophecy began all those years ago, before Pentecost, a thousand years before. It was started to be fulfilled right there when Cyrus says, send them back to Israel. And when they went back to Israel and they began to occupy their land again, God started to restore their land. In fact, that prophecy is still being fulfilled today. If you go to Israel right now, I have read this so many times, I have to believe that it's true. I am no a fruit and world trade expert. But they say that there is more fruit produced from Israel than any other country in the world. And why is that? Because they have the rains and the soil that comes like clockwork. God said He would do it, and He really is doing it. He's still doing it today. So Israel is a top, yeah, okay. So how do we, so here's, here's the thing. The reason why I say it really doesn't matter for my point today, whether he's talking about physical uh, droughts or if he's talking about uh, the, the fact that they're going to be taken away by the Assyrian army. It could be both. It could be that they were experiencing both, right? But the point is, he's not talking about the Holy Ghost and Pentecost. Not at all. He is not talking about the Holy Ghost and Pentecost in chapter 1 and all the way through the destruction or into the time of repentance or in that I'm going to restore the rain. So we can't say that there's going to be an early rain of Pentecost and then there's going to be some latter outpouring of the Holy Ghost in the last days. This is where we get this whole latter rain movement that started popular back, I guess, in the 70s. Is it, what is that when that was, 70s or even before? I don't even know. But the latter rain movement, they caught a hold of this, and they started saying that there's the, the early rain is Pentecost, and then there's going to be a latter rain that's going to come at the end times, and God's going to pour out His Spirit double, the former and the latter rain together. So they're misinterpreting all of this, and they're mixing it up, and they're trying to allegorize the whole thing. Okay, so how do we know? that the former and the latter and all that doesn't have anything to do with Pentecost because Peter said so. When they were speaking in tongues and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost was happening on Pentecost and they said, what meaneth this? Wouldn't it have been cool for Peter to say, well, this is the early rain? But he didn't. This is that that was prophesied by the prophet Joel. This is the early rain. He didn't. So what did he say? He says, this is that that was prophesied by the prophet Joel, and he goes straight to verse 28. Now let's read verse 28 in Joel. Now Joel says there's going to be bad stuff happening, the canker worm, the locust, and the northern army is going to come. You're going to serve um, your enemies instead of serving God, right? You're going to repent. And then I'm going to heal your land. I'm going to drive back the armies. And I'm going to bring you back to your land. And everything's going to be great. Period. And it shall come to pass afterwards. After that. A thousand years later. And it shall come to pass afterwards. That I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. This is Pentecost. That is the outpouring of the Holy Ghost right there. It's not a former and a latter. The, the Holy Ghost is going to be opened up for everybody all the time, and God's never going to close the door. Heaven's going to be opened from that moment forward. 
God's never going to withhold the Holy Ghost. He's never, until the day comes when we are gathered with Him up in heaven, right? Okay, so verse 28 is a prophecy about the time after the Messiah, when God would pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Verse 28 begins a new, a new event. So how do we know? Well, because Peter said so. All right. So uh, he didn't, yeah, okay, he didn't say this is the former rain. He said this is the outpouring. I'm trying to catch up here. So when God released His Holy Ghost on Pentecost, the door of heaven was opened and has never been closed. There has at no time since Pentecost till now that God restricted, withheld, or reserved His promise. Not one time. So we are not experiencing a latter rain. We are experiencing Pentecost still today. And that is how that Scripture should be interpreted and how the Bible should be interpreted. Now, some could argue and be truthful that there's more people today getting the Holy Ghost than, than there was then, and I wouldn't disagree with that. But that still doesn't make me interpret Joel any different. <laughs> that just means there's more people on the planet. That just means that there's the, the gospel is being spread around the world, that good, more people are receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost today than ever before in history, and that is absolutely true. But that doesn't mean that Joel prophesied that that's what it would be in that moment. I don't need the prophecy of Joel chapter 27 to prove that, if that makes sense. All right. So, th let's go back here, and we'll close with this, get you some tea and some whatever you got, uh, coffee or whatever. So, he goes, it, it is for your children. So, understand, both Deuteronomy and Joel tell us how the judgment would be upon them and their children. And so, whenever we see this, when, but, okay, but, but then when we see in Joel that the Spirit will be, what did Joel say? Joel said that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out, and it shall come to pass afterwards, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your, remember Deuteronomy says your kids, they're going to be cursed, it's going to be bad, and then he even says your sons and your daughters will be, you'll have sons and daughters, but you won't be able to enjoy them because they're going to be in captivity. Well, here's what he said. He says, even your sons and your daughters will be able to have this blessing. And then that's what Peter, when he said, uh, I think we talked about this already, but when he says, and this promise is for you and your children. So this fulfills that, that day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost fulfills all of those prophecies of the Old Testament in completion. Praise God. I, hey, I'm thankful I, that the Lord didn't withhold anything. He's just left that door open. And the promise is free and has been available for all of us. Praise God. Happy Pentecost Sunday. Let's go have a coffee. And we're going to have church in a minute. Praise the Lord.